What up, guys? Welcome to New Jersey HorrorCon. How y'all doing out there? We have a legend, an icon, and a true master of horror with us today, guys. So let's not waste any time. Make a whole lot of noise for the legendary Mick Garris. I didn't know who you were talking about. It's just me. Mick Foley. Um. <laughs> yeah. Where do you see my moves? <laughs> so, starting at the beginning, if we could, other than making 8mm home movies, it kind of seems like you got your start as a freelance critic and publicist, stuff like that, going from working with bands to writing in Starlog. So, how crucial was that period in building a foundation for your career? I think everything has something to do with it. Um, if you're pursuing any, any career in the arts, it's because you love it. And for me, it was curiosity. I was a, a music journalist uh, first. I was a singer in a band. I, I interviewed Janis Joplin and, and Jimi Hendrix and people when I was in high school. Um, you know, music was important to me. And I hate to say it now, it's not important to me at all. Um, but uh, that's just me. Um, it could also be music today, because I have a similar thing, that music used to be very important. And new these music. These kids today and their music. I'm telling you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it was, you know, when I was growing up and, and in the 70s when I was in a band, it was a, a very imaginative time musically. But okay. to answer your question, um, I think if you have a questing creative mind, everything creative fascinates you. And even in high school, I, was, I interviewed Ray Bradbury and Rod Serling. I just, wow. they were coming to speak at the college nearby and I was writing for the school newspaper and nothing would be more fascinating to me than to talk to these heroes of mine, oh, yeah. these gods. And I found out that it's possible to do that. And being a journalist was, was how I did that. And I figure if I'm learning something from it, the readers or the viewers or the listeners are learning from it too. Wow. And I, I've just always been curious and it's, it's why I do the podcast today because I learn something from every single person I interview or meet or talk to. Totally. And, and I think all knowledge feeds who you are. Totally, totally. And, you know, just riffing on that, I mean, thank you so much for, for giving that back because I'm probably just as excited <laughs> to talk to you as you were to talk to Rod Serling. I guarantee you that. Um, I doubt it. This is no, <laughs> this, is, this is definitely a big deal. Um, it's, a, it's a big trade off, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> so from there, you actually wound up working for George Lucas, of all people. Um, I did. So I what did. do you remember about, you know, working, him in, you know, working with him in such a reg revolutionary place and, and well, that time? And, and it, it wasn't really a revolutionary place where I worked. It was a former motel that was an office um, uh, across the street from Universal Studios. He had made um, American Graffiti for Universal, so he was based not even on the lot, but off the lot. Oh, wow. And so I was answering phones for his new company, Star Wars Corporation. Wow. So my job was as a receptionist. I maybe met George once or twice the whole oh, wow. time because he was based up north oh, uh, okay. in, in Northern so. California. So um, I rarely spoke to him or anything, but I was answering phones for $150 a week. Star Wars, may I help you? <laughs> And, uh, but wow. even that, I learned from that because they needed somebody to operate the R2-D2 robot at personal appearances. And so I learned how to run him and I wow. ran him on the Oscars that year. Get so out. the only time in my life I ever did go or will go to the Oscars. And uh, wow. so I operated R2-D2 on the Oscars in wow. 1978. Wow, so, that is incredible. I am the Zelig of horror. So. <laughs> Any of you old enough to know who Zelig is? Yeah. Okay. So, um, how did that lead to the Fantasy Film Festival show? The Fantasy Film Festival, there was a channel in Los Angeles called the Z Channel. It was the first pay TV channel in Los Angeles. They didn't carry HBO or Showtime, and they showed two movies and they ran all week long, just, just like a movie theater. It'd be two movies alternating. So, I went in and started writing. Uh, doing the write-ups for what the movies were for their magazine, their monthly magazine to subscribers. And I th had the idea of doing 
a genre-oriented show. They were showing the genre movies anyway, mixed in with all the others, but to do something special. The, the lead movie critic, Charles Champlin, for the LA Times, also did an interview show on the channel, and I thought, what if we did something for science fiction, fantasy, and horror films? And uh, the Fantasy Film Festival was my idea, and the, the program director said, well, give me a list of 20 movies you would have on here, and let's see who we can come up with and say who you'd interview. And so I did, and we actually did it. I had Steven Spielberg on, I had Christopher Lee on, had all these people on this show because I was in Los Angeles and this particular cable company serviced Beverly Hills and Santa Monica and the West Side where all of these people who made movies lived. So it was very weird being this kid who was a, a film and music journalist doing this TV show quite nervously, you know, uh, Mr. Spielberg. Uh, and, <laughs> And, uh, and going around and people, aren't you that guy on the Z channel when I go in the market or something? It was like, <laughs> nobody knew my name, but it was always, aren't you that guy on the Z channel? And so that should be the name of my biography is, aren't you that guy on the Z channel? <laughs> That's a pretty decent title. Yeah. Um, so who was your most intimidating guest on the show then? Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee. Far. Oh, well, I could... no, You know, Harlan Ellison was on. Oh, and, wow. Um, Harlan was quite capable of being an asshole, even though we were friends. <laughs> and I say that with love, sort of. Um, <laughs> but uh, he likes to be intimidating. It's part of who he was, was to, to show who's boss and to, to, to be the alpha male. And so um, he also, well, the director of A Boy and His Dog was, now I'm blanking on his name, but I didn't know that the two of them hated each other. I'd invited them both to come on about the movie. We were showing the movie. And Harwin said, ah, if you bring him on, I'm not doing the show. And, oh, well, um, hmm, let me see. <laughs> and so oh, I thought wow. Harwin would be the more colorful guest, oh, wow. uh, which I did. But I had to, uh, to let, uh, let the director know that, gosh, something happened and we're not going to be able to bring you in. So, Scheduling uh, mistake. Yeah. <laughs> Clerical yeah, error. Exactly. So that was tough. But Christopher Lee can be very imperious. And at that time, you know, I'm new at this, do, especially doing interviews on television. And Christopher Lee can, loved the sound of his voice. And he would go on and on. And I didn't know how to guide an interview. So I kind of got trampled by someone oh, talking wow. about things that ne didn't necessarily entertain the audience that he was talking to. Oh, so, again, everything I've ever done is an education to me. And that was a big education to wow. me. Wow, very cool, very cool. So We're going way back here. <laughs> so not long after that, you started directing, making of promos, doing film press more exclusively and stuff like that. And in an interesting bit of career foreshadowing, you even interviewed Scatman Crothers in promotion of Stanley Kubrick's Shining. Yeah, um, not, not to promote it, but it was on the Z Channel oh, show. It was, on, it was oh, for the yeah. Z Channel show, okay. Yeah, we, so yeah. uh, what were your experiences like with that, and did you ever think in a million years that this is going to kind of come full circle for me one day? Never, ever, ever. No, Scatman was on. I was able to get him. They were showing The Shining, and I certainly wasn't going to be able to get Stanley Kubrick. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to get Jack Nicholson. Uh, but Scatman, uh, I could get him. The sweetest man in the world. I loved him. He told great stories. A lot of these interviews, if you're interested, are, are on from a Betamax recording from the, uh, the yes. day. But um, uh, I have an interview site of my video interviews, mickgarrisinterviews.com, if you're interested in seeing. But the Spielberg interview is on there. And yeah, amazing, uh, amazing yeah. stuff there, guys. So, Definitely worth checking so, out. So it's kind of historical stuff that that I'm really proud to, to be able to have maintained. Um, but no, I, I never in a million years thought I would be directing The Shining because Stephen King wanted me to because he hated <laughs> S Stanley Kubrick's version. Infamously so, hated it. Infamously. It's, oh, it's yeah. so good. I love, I love these stories. So then in 1981 alone, you made promotion, promotional featurettes for Scanners, The Howling, and Halloween 2. So how much I fun? I didn't do a making of Halloween too. I did the fog. Though. 
Oh, it was the fog. Okay, yeah. I'm, I apologize on that. My research led me astray. Ah. Um, well, being still, though, um, what was it like to now be in an inner circle with David Cronenberg, Joe Dante, and John Carpenter? That had to be mind-blowing. It, it was phenomenal. And right after that, I did a round table with Cronenberg, Carpenter, and um, Landis. I saw that. all Reece. had Amazing. movies coming out at Universal. Videodrome, The Thing, and American Werewolf in London were all released around the same time. So I was working in publicity for Universal, and I thought it would be a great idea to get the three of these directors to talk about horror and give it away to TV channels all across the country. They could use quips from it on the news. They could run it in full at 11 o'clock at night after their news or whatever. So that was kind of the first national thing I ever did along those lines. But it was incredible. I never felt like I was a peer of theirs. Because I, I had a long way to go before I was a writer and producer and director. But I, I got to be friends with them even before I became uh, a filmmaker. Wow. And Landis really got me my first job as a director, which we'll get into. When, we will, yes, ready. very much. Yeah. Um, so. But they, beca- they, all, they were friends. And the first, t- the first thing I ever had to do with Cronenberg, I had written him a, a note when I was working at Star Wars. Uh, as a receptionist and I wrote it on Star Wars stationery because I had seen um, they, uh, they came from within or shivers and rabbit on a double bill and they blew me away and I just sent him a fan letter and because it was on Star Wars stationery he remembered it years later when, oh, wow. when I was doing publicity on uh, scanners. Oh yeah. wow that's so cool. So, um, and you also, you know, speaking of The Fog and Adrian Barbeau, you also did do promotion for The Thing as well, right? I did. I did The Making of The Thing. The Making of The Thing. And and, um, lots of other publicity things for that. So when you're on set around that movie, do you say to yourself, this is how you do a remake? Like, did you kind of make a mental note? And was there any fuel in the tank that that you kind of went back to later on on that experience? You know, all of it is absorbed, but not consciously. I never thought, oh, wait, here, I'm doing... Because I never thought of The Shining as a remake. Right. It it was doing honor to the book. Right. You know, doing... Appropriate, proper adaptation. What we thought was, was... telling the story King had told. We know the difference between film and, and books. There's a big difference there. But in, in the case of The Shining, it was a very personal book to King. It's about alcoholism when he was drinking. It's about the guilt of a parent feeling violent impulses toward a child, all of that sort of thing. None of that is in the Kubrick film. Kubrick made a great Kubrick film, right. but not a good King adaptation in King's mind and in the minds of a lot of people who'd read the book first. Yeah, um, but going back to your question, no, I, it was not something I thought of because when you're making a movie, you're just trying to make the best movie you can, not the best remake you can or best sequel you can. Very true. You, you're just doing what you hope is the best way to tell a story possible. At least that's my approach. Oh, it makes a hell of a lot of sense to me. Um, so, you know, and again, not to harp too much on the publicity era, but because you've touched so many incredible horror films, uh, we do have to talk about Poltergeist, of course. Um, uh, yeah. Years later, uh, you actually even helped squash the rumors of people saying, oh, Spielberg directed it, you know, and, and you helped squash that, saying, no, I was there. Toby Hooper directed this film, which is really amazing to me as a, as a Toby Hooper fan. Um, so, you know, the question being, obviously you already had a relationship with Spielberg. It was that really the beginning of your working relationship together? Yeah, and I didn't know him until I was doing publicity on... I had met him doing the interview for Z Channel. Right. And that did not really lead to me doing the publicity. I was hired by Avco Embassy, and the head of Avco Embassy moved to Universal, which is the company that did... Um, that did the thing and they did E.T. and Poltergeist was shot at the same time as E.T. kind of back and forth but um, yeah it was it it was uh, the first time we really worked together but he didn't hire me then the studio did so um, I gotta be honest the Poltergeist curse freaks me out a little bit so I have to ask was there ever anything on set anything ever freaked you out you know (laughs) you never know (laughs) I've had a good life. (laughs) Um, 
So you uh, lightened things up a little bit, and Team Spielberg again, when you did making of footage for the Goonies. So I was curious um, if you, there was much you learned working with Richard Donner on the set of that film. Well, doing the making of it really is, was only like three days of shooting. They'd pick, here, this is good, we can have you there, and you won't be in the way. This day, we can have you there, and you won't be in the way. And being the making of guy is the least respected guy on the set, because you're always in the way. Um, the first time I ever did it was on the Videodrome. Uh, making of in Toronto and I'm very proud because it's one of the first thing I've done and, and I'm directing this documentary on a Cronenberg film and the sound guy is saying who are you? I tell him my name what are you doing here? Uh, well I'm making the documentary on the making of the film because you're in the way oh sorry and you realize fly on the wall stays on the wall <laughs> you know and not any closer um so what I really learned from the making of's, but even more than that, was working, we'll get to amazing stories as a writer, and being on the set is that most directing does not happen on the set. It happens before you get to the set. Makes um, a lot of sense. The planning, the discussions you've had with the actors on, on what the characterizations are, uh, what kind of lighting setups you want to be doing, because that all has to be done beforehand. So yes, a lot of work is done on the stage, or on the location, but so much more of it is done in pre-production, something I'm not privy to. So although I learned a lot by being on these sets, I, would, I, I didn't learn that much about the process of directing because that happens behind the curtain. Right, yeah. that makes sense. So your first screenwriting credit came not long after that with um, John Landis is coming soon. Yeah. Uh, was it challenging to write in that type of format of trailer and clip hosting and that kind of stuff? Yeah, well, this was sort of like writing a press kit in a way, which I had done as a publicist. So it, it wasn't a promotional film, but coming soon, if you're not familiar with it, and I'm sure none of you are, was a documentary of, it was a compilation of trailers from Universal uh, their horror history, because that studio was kind of made on the bones of their horror movies. The Dracula, Frankenstein, Phantom of the, of the uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, opera. Anyway, um, so we put together and got Jamie Lee Curtis, I was her publicist at the time, and got her to host this, and that led to John Landis hiring her uh, as an actress in into the night? No. Um, anyway, <laughs> he worked with her on that because he directed her on that. But uh, it was a concept I'd had to establish Universal again as a house of horror because they were doing the thing. They did American Werewolf in London. Yeah. Uh, they did uh, Videodrome. Yeah. So uh, it was a way to tie in Universal's history with its present and future in that regard. And so Landis and I were friends and we talked about doing that, and it was the first made-for-home video ever done with a major film director directing it. Oh, wow. So um, it, uh, the only way it came out was on VHS and beta and on a Japanese laser disc. I was going to say, no laser disc? <laughs> Japanese laser disc only, with wow. subtitles burned in. Yeah. No CBD or anything like that? <laughs> So then a few years later, of course, you're hired by Steven Spielberg to write the groundbreaking Amazing Stories. Was yeah. that project something you two had discussed before when you'd worked together? Or oh, was hell that... no. No. <laughs> no, that's not something he needed my input on. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that came together. Uh, that was one of the biggest deals, television deals ever made at that time. Oh, yeah. Because Steven was riding the crest of his career. I mean, just huge. E.T. had been the biggest movie in history, and, and then Raiders of the Lost Ark, and all the movies of the 80s that were so enormous that NBC basically said, you can do whatever you want. And smart he made move. this very expensive show. Well, it was a smart move creatively, but it tanked 
Really? It started out very successful and then went down very quickly because you're getting something completely different every week. One time it would be an animated show, Family Dog. There was one, uh, you know, you'd get something really scary. Mm -hmm. You'd get something heartwarming and ghosts. And it, it was very schizophrenic in a way that I liked and I encouraged that on Masters of Horror later. But there was no host, there was no Rod Serling, there was no Alfred Hitchcock. And they would love to have had Steven Spielberg do of it. Of course. But, but he wanted to do it and, and encourage each of these filmmakers to make a film that has their fingerprints on it. Wow. So by the time they had committed to two years, to 44 episodes right up front, which was unheard of. It had wow. never been done before. It was groundbreaking. Yeah. And they lived to regret it because season two was... A, just nobody was watching. They put it on Saturday night where, oh, you know, they just kind of ate their losses. Wow. I, you know, I didn't discover it until about 10 years or so later because I was very young when it originally sure. aired. And it had this sort of comeback in the 90s for, I don't know, it started airing on TV again. But do you remember that air at all when it sort of had like a sort of a swing back a little bit? Well, it was always kind of hard to get, especially season two was difficult to get. And so... There was a little bit of that, but now, of course, they're they're doing a new version for Apple TV. Uh, really, uh, Spielberg and the producers of Once Upon a Time, uh, really? Eddie Kitsis and uh, and um, um, Horowitz, Adam Horowitz, uh, oh, wow. are producing that with uh, Steven Spielberg, and they just announced it at this big Apple event uh, Monday. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's crazy. I hadn't even heard about that yet. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah. right? Absolutely. Not working on it, but I'm looking forward <laughs> to it. All right, so then moving on. If, uh, if there was any kid that lived through the 80s and did not see Batteries Not Included, <laughs> they would have been laughed out of the town where I grew up in. Yay. Um, <laughs> yes, that's right. Make some fucking noise. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, I'm credited with Story By. <laughs> So how did the germ of the idea get started? It was an Amazing Stories episode that, uh, when we started Amazing Stories, Steven Spielberg had come up with storylines for 22 episodes, wow. all himself. Uh, and one of the, there were two of them that he thought would make good features instead of uh, being half hour episodes of a TV show. And one of those was called Gramps and Grammy and Company. And so that became Batteries Not Included. Oh, wow. And uh, at that time, Stephen asked me which of these stories I would like to do as a feature because he was very happy with the work I'd been doing. And I loved that one. Um, and uh, so I wrote the screenplay. And the first time, I, it was the first time I'd written a feature film for Steven Spielberg. And very intimidating, but I also wrote the shit out of it, meaning it was way too long. It was 140 pages long, and it was overwritten, and so I'm being brutally honest here about myself, but Steven Spielberg said to me when he read it, um, it took me three sittings to read the script, and that's not a good thing. And so it was, like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I messed up my opportunity. So I, the first thing I did on the rewrite was go home and cut it down to, you know, a hundred and some pages and, and uh, everything, you know, I took everything he said to heart and then it got a green light on the new draft. So everything came out okay. But when he hired um, Matthew to direct the film, Matthew is also a writer and he brought in Brad Bird to co-write it with him. Uh, and so the two of them, Brad Bird, of course, is the director and writer of The Incredibles and all these fantastic, you know, Iron Giant, just great, great animation stuff. And he also did Family Dog for Amazing Stories. Yeah. So um, once, uh, once Matthew got involved as director, he brought in Brad and said, well, we're going to do it my way. And then I was no longer involved. Mm -hmm. But rather than it saying story by Steven Spielberg and Mick Garris, Steven was very generous and said, look, you did so much work on this. You got this the green light. You can have sole story credit. I don't oh, need wow. it. Yeah. Very, very generous and wonderful guy. 
That's awesome. I have That's... nothing but good things to say about it. Wow, super cool. So how did you come to be involved in the Critters franchise and end up writing part two? And what are your thoughts on the upcoming Critters A New Binge? Well, the new binge is already out. Oh, it's, it's, out it's on Shutter now. Oh, okay. And um, I haven't seen it. Okay. I haven't seen it. <laughs> uh, and there is a new movie for for a Sci-Fi Channel that is completely unrelated, but it's another Critters movie with the same designs and everything that they shot in South Africa. And in fact, our editor on Nightmare Cinema was the editor of the new Critters movie. That's coming up for sci-fi. Oh, wow. uh, I, I haven't seen, it's not finished yet, but I haven't seen that either. But uh, the way it happened was the first Critters was modestly successful theatrical film. Um, and it's very Spielbergian. So I think what they wanted to do, because I had been developing a career as a screenwriter for, for studios, was this was the first movie that was ever a greenlit movie that was offered to me. Often you're, giving, you're given a script to see if you're interested in it, what do you think, and, and they're talking to a bunch of different people about it, but they actually said, we would like you to direct this movie and you can rewrite it any way you like. What I think they wanted, because it was so Spielbergian in the first one, was to actually hire somebody who was working for Spielberg to write and direct this movie in the hopes that some of that would rub off. So um, that was the opportunity, and, and I really had a great time. I, at first, I didn't want to do a, a special effects movie for my first film because it's so damn difficult. Uh, and I had passed on things they'd sent me, like, honey, I shrunk the kids, and it was like, that's so difficult. I don't know that that should be my first movie. So instead, I'm doing a movie at a really low budget with lots of effects and animals and children and everything difficult about shooting that you can imagine. So, um, but that movie was a total flop. Nobody went and saw it in the theaters. It's, it's far more popular now than it was uh, 30 years ago when it came out. Yeah, I went to my local movie theater up at uh, Universal City, and uh, on opening day, there were two other people in the theater. It was, ow! So, well, there goes my directing career. Yeah. But fortunately, I got hired again. So. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I say the same thing. Thank you. Thank you, human resources. Yeah. So you got involved with yet another iconic horror franchise when you directed an episode of Freddy's Nightmares. Um, <laughs> yeah. What was that experience like, and how much freedom did you have considering that it had to air on network TV? Well, it was syndicated, so it wasn't on network. Uh, oh. it, the budgets were really, really, really low. It was shot on 16 millimeter as well. There was not much creative freedom because you didn't have time. It was done very quickly. I would say if you're looking at my stuff, you can pass on that one. <laughs> you can, we'll be good friends if you don't watch that one. Um, and I think you'll, you'll have more respect for me. Um, so glad I brought it up. Yeah, no, no you can thank me it, later. Was, it was a step, but Bob Shea, it was made by New Line, which made the Critters movies. Right. And so Bob Shea was the head of the studio. Right. And they were making this, and I absolutely was full of gratitude having been given my first feature by Bob Shea and, and New Line Studios. So I was happy to do it, and I had a good time doing it, but it wasn't very good. But I did get them Toby Hooper to do the first one, and that one turned out really well. Yeah, that was good. Very true, very true. So you etched yourself into 80s history yet again when you wrote The Fly 2. <laughs> how, how did that come about, and what was your favorite memory of the film? Well, how do I put this? Um, no, I, it, was, it was a writing job that was offered to me, and David Cronenberg was one of the people who recommended me for it, so that really wow. had a lot of juice at 20th oh. Century Fox. <laughs> and I got Mel Brooks's company was the production company, Brooks Films. He had done... Elephant Man, he did the first fly and was producing this. So working with Mel Brooks was amazing wow. and incredibly intelligent and intellectual and educated guy who could tell you 
how story structure and everything works. Really brilliant in in film history and all of that, wow. and and unbelievably funny. Um, so the greatest thing was being able to work with Mel Brooks and to do this. But I had a much more adventurous storyline idea that was shut down because they wanted to turn it into a teenage monster movie. And I think the Cronenberg movie of the fly is maybe the best monster movie ever. I, I think it's a work of genius. I think it's a great, great film because it's a great drama first and the horror is layered on top of that and it makes it that much more powerful because it lives in you and you become a part of that. And I wanted The Fly 2 to be that. But The Fly 2 now, when people think of it, everybody goes, oh yeah, the dog scene, I hated that. It's like, um, so uh, once I got hired to do, well, I had written a draft that was the version that the producer Stuart Kornfeld and I came up with, which we were really proud of. Then they changed studio heads, and a guy, uh, Leonard Goldberg, who was uh, a TV producer, became the head of 20th Century Fox, and he wanted to do a teenage monster movie. And so we reconceptualized, and I started working on it. I did another draft, then I got offered Fly 2, uh, uh, Critters 2, uh, to direct. And so I, gosh, I'm afraid I have to take this job. And then Frank Darabont was the next person hired on Fly 2, and then the Wheat Brothers. So I was not involved in the making of the movie at all. I was never on the set. It was shot in Vancouver. Um, and Chris Wayless was the makeup effects artist who had won an Oscar for The Fly. And so he had never directed before, but they, he, he was selected to direct the movie. And is a wonderful guy and a great director. But, um, you know, the movie, I, I wish it could have been something more adult, like the first one was, and, and not quite the most. I have to learn to say just thank you very much when people say they like something instead of saying, yeah, but it could have been, you know. So, so I saw you making terrible faces, so I go, thank you very much for liking the fly, too. Oh, man, it's hilarious. Um, so you put your mark on yet even another iconic franchise when you developed the show She Wolf of London. Um, Is that iconic? I don't, people watched that? Yeah, oh, yeah. You heard the applause? Fucking A. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I heard all three of you. <laughs> but two of them were clapping really hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're clapping twice as fast. Yeah. Um, but what was it like working in, I kind of dubbed that year, those eras, the early golden years of TV because. You know, I feel like they were trying a lot of things. I mean, did yeah, you get with that Freddy's impression? Yeah, Nightmares and that, and, you know. Well, originally, Universal was going to try and... For this was before the Fox network existed. And Universal was going to try and create their own network. They ended up with two stations, WOR here and KHJ in Los Angeles, both independent non-network stations. And they thought they would build it out into a national network, but it didn't work that way. They started with two shows, She Wolf of London, and they came from outer space. I love that. I love both and, of and, shows. and Tom McLaughlin and I co wrote the, the pilot for She Wolf of London, and I created the show, and Tommy helped me with that. And Tommy created They Came From Outer Space. And he also directed my favorite Friday the 13th movie, number six. Oh, mine too. Jason Lives. So, so Tommy's good. a really great guy as well. Oh, man. Yeah, big fan of his too. But it was, it, it again was something I started, and then they brought, they wanted me to, to be the showrunner producer. And at that time, I was having a very successful career as a screenwriter in, in features and doing studio movies and the like. And the last thing I wanted was to not be available to do those things like. Hocus Pocus, um, yes. and I wouldn't have been able to. And so other producers took it over and changed the course of it. And, and uh, so again, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. So you changed straight up, changed what was possible on television and brought class back to one of the genre's greatest franchises when you directed Psycho 4. <laughs> How tough was it to earn Anthony Perkins' respect, and what are you most proud of about the film? Well, really tough. And what I'm most proud of about the film is that I did earn his respect. Um, Perkins 
apart from starring in the original Psycho with Alfred Hitchcock, had made The Trial with Orson Welles, had made movies with William Wyler, had worked with the greatest filmmakers in history. He also directed Psycho 3, which was a critical and financial disaster. Um, and he wanted to direct Psycho 4, and the studio wouldn't let him. So who did they hire? The director of Critters 2. <laughs> so that's a tough road to hoe. But Landis and I were friends, and John and, and Tony Perkins were friends. So we arranged a lunch because Tony had director approval. And Landis said, Mick is a good guy. You'll like him. And, and I had gone through the script. And we had a really great meeting. And so everything was approved. But he would always test, test me because I was a young, new filmmaker who had made one feature before and done television work. And, you know, I had a great passion for Hitchcock, but we knew we were not making Hitchcock's movie, we were making something 30 years later. So it took a long time to, to gain his respect, and he was a complicated individual, and, and he would test me. There was one time I remember in particular where Again, we'd gone over every line in the script together and, and been in agreement on the approach and all this. And there's a scene where he gets angry when he's talking on the, talk, on, on the phone to a talk radio host, CCH Pounder. And he slams a butcher knife into the butcher table <clears throat> in the kitchen. And so we're setting up to shoot that, and Tony says, Now, Mick, don't you think this has been done to death over and over the butcher knife and it's just so boring and hoary and just, I kind of like it you know, but um, so he went on literally for 45 minutes talking about his feelings about what this should be so it was a great education in directing once again how do you deal with this he's the famous person here I've got a set of people filled with 60 crew members waiting for the job. And it was like, Tony, why don't we step away and discuss this? Crew, set up the lighting, get everything ready, the dolly track and the way we talked about it. And then we worked it out. And so we talked and we decided on instead. And it's much more effective. It was a good thing he brought it up, despite the 45 minutes. But instead, in rage, he picks up an apple and just snaps it in half. and it's. It's ne you've never seen apple snapping, have you? Okay. And, and it worked in the same way without having to resort to that. But it was something, you know, you can either be steamrollered as a first timer or a second timer when you're working with a movie star, or you can show that you're both on the same team and you both want what's best for the movie and that's what matters. And I'm not a confrontational type person, but you have to also show some intestinal fortitude to show that you know how to do your job, even if you're just learning how to do your job and rolling with the punches and not be rolled over. Um, so I do want to I do want to open up to the audience, guys. I don't want to hog it all too much. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions you're dying to get in there with. Anyone uh, got anything? Oh, there we go in the back there. Oh, First of all, thank you. This has been fascinating. Second, talk about, I'm a huge fan of Masters of Horror. If you could just tell us a little bit about that historic meeting, that dinner you had. Ah. Bring that up tomorrow. Let's go. Well, we still have those dinners. We just had one um, almost two weeks ago. Uh, we don't have them often. The last one we'd had before that was a tribute to Toby Hooper. Um, wow. And it was incredibly emotional. And this one was done for Larry Cohen because oh, he wouldn't let anybody know he was sick. I knew, but he didn't know I knew. But he kept asking for one of these dinners because he loved them so much. He had such a great time. And he kept asking, is Quentin going to be there? Is Quentin going to be there? Because they would always have great conversations, Tarantino and him. So we had the dinner, and I kicked myself for not doing it a week earlier because he was too sick to make it. But I was able to see him the next day, and he was all, all there all the way to the end. Just a wonderful, wonderful guy. And Quentin did come to the dinner, 
and I told Quentin the secret I couldn't tell anybody else, and Quentin called him and made his day. It was just, Quentin's a really terrific guy. He doesn't seem like a warm, cuddly guy, but he really is. He really made Larry's day, in, and it was one of his very last days. I think it was three days before he passed. So the dinner is to answer your question. Um, it was just, you know, events like these, filmmakers run into each other here, or at film festivals, or at, at guild events, things like that, because directors never work together. So you don't see how each other does the job. So it was just a social thing to get a group of people together people who were always saying, you know, we all ought to get together and have a dinner sometime. Well, that went on for a couple of years before I thought, you know, nobody's going to do this, so I may as well. And I did, and it took like a week to work out everybody's schedules and a night that they could make it, and everybody was going, oh, I don't know. So we did the first one. There were 12 directors there. It was Toby Hooper, it was Wes Craven, it was John Carpenter, it was Stuart Gordon, it was John Landis, it was Will, William Malone. I mean, it was uh, Coscarelli. It was, it was an amazing night, and everybody had such a good time that a couple months later when I tried the next one, it took me an hour to put it together. Everybody said yes. So after having done this for a while, we started talking, you know, it was mostly a social thing, not a work thing or a networking thing at all, but talking about how we never had control of the material we were doing, and wouldn't it be great to give the keys to the madhouse to the insane? And so we got together, I put together a format, and got people to agree to it that if we sold it, they would put their name on paper saying they would do it if they were available. And so we took it out to three different places, all of which said, we want to do it. And the first one said, how much and when can we start? And so that's how Masters of Horror came to be from those dinners. So, yeah. Anybody hungry? Very <laughs> cool. Yeah. Hi, Vic. I'm a resident of Salem, Massachusetts. Oh, awesome. Uh, so Oh, absolutely. You know, what happened was it, when I was researching Hocus Pocus, the idea was uh, David Kirshner, the producer, came up with this idea about the Sanderson sisters and all. But um, I went back to Salem to research it, and I discovered the 11 days of Halloween that climaxes on Halloween night at Gallows Hill with a candlelight vigil of all the witches. And for those who don't know, there are more witches in Salem than any other town in the world. A lot of them are real bullshitty New Age witches <laughs> that are really arrogant and shitty. But, but the history is something, and it's so amazing that I went back six years in a row to celebrate Halloween there because it had such a great impact on me. And I recommend that to anybody who hasn't been there. So, yeah, I was really glad that I went there and saw that history, and that had a lot to do with that script. And the 11 writers on it after me. I wrote my scripts eight years before the movie was produced. Was your script darker? Sorry? Was your script darker? My script was darker, yes. Um, you know, it was always called, uh, Disney was always in the title. It was going to be Disney's Halloween house. But, you know, as you might imagine, Billy Butcher was more my baby than Kirshner's or Disney's. And, uh, yeah, it was definitely darker and not as slapsticky. Obviously, they made the right decision. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm very, very proud of the movie and, and what it has become. And it may be more lighthearted, but it's pretty phenomenal to have been involved with something that everyone has seen. Right? And every female I've ever met, it's like, you know, Hocus Pocus is my favorite movie, really? Mine too. <laughs> <laughs>
So riffing on that, if I could, um, are you going to catch up with Jason Marsden, Jason Marsden at all this weekend, who voiced Binks? I just caught up with him earlier today. Oh, uh, awesome. uh, We were in the elevator together. Oh, wow. And Small world. Yeah, I hadn't seen him in, in like, years. Yeah. Oh, wow. Very cool. Yeah. yeah, he looks not different at all. He hasn't changed a bit. Not at all. I exactly. know. Yeah, he hasn't aged a day. Um, so we had some more questions out there, I believe. Okay. Let's yeah. do them all. Um, about Masters of Horror, the, the new set of horror directors coming out, like Guillermo del Toro and Gordon Are there any plans to... Like, oh, Guillermo was also at that first dinner, too. Yeah. Is there, like, any plans to, like, redo Masters of Horror? <coughs> generation, I guess. We're not going to redo Masters of Horror, but I've got a movie coming out this summer called Nightmare Cinema that was done, <laughs> thank you, that was done with the same philosophy. It's five different directors, each telling a different story, and they're all stylistically completely different. But it's more international than Masters of Horror. Well, Joe Dante and I are the, the two token American directors. Then we've got um, Ryuhei Kitamura from Japan, who did Midnight Meat Train. And Versus, yeah, exactly, Downrange. Um, and uh, uh, Alejandro Bruges, who did Juan of the Dead, which is amazing. And uh, David Slade, who did, of course, Hard Candy, 30 Days of Night, uh, Hannibal Pilot, American Gods Pilot. So it's, I'm really, really proud of this movie, and it'll be out in June. So, not Masters of Horror, because a couple of the producers who were involved are people I don't want to make money off of that, and I won't make it again, <laughs> but, um, but it's better. <laughs> yeah. Speak up, because I'm, we're fighting the pinball machine. <laughs> so, Masters of Horror, you also had uh, Fear Itself for uh, that whole season. That was probably, was it different uh, in that series than Masters of Horror? Like, Okay, the question was, how different was making Fear itself from doing Masters of Horror? Well, a lot. Um, originally, after uh, Masters of Horror's first two seasons were done, the company was sold. Uh, uh, Anchor Bay was sold, and uh, Lionsgate bought it, and they decided they wanted to do a third season and went to Showtime, and Showtime said, oh, well, Lionsgate wanted twice as much money, because they weren't paying much for it. And Showtime did that. And so we don't need it, it's fine, you can go somewhere else. So Lionsgate went to NBC with it. And when I knew they were going to do it with a commercial network, well, the whole philosophy of Masters of Horror was the Masters of Horror do their movies their way with no interference. And that was my job, was to protect them. Well, you're going to have Pampers commercials and you're going to have, you know, broadcast standards, everything that stands in the way of making good horror. So I said I didn't want to do it. But people, Stuart Gordon for one and some of the other directors, Stuart said, look, there's, there was Twilight Zone. That was great for commercial network TV. There was Outer Limits. And so they talked me into to going forward with it. And then I discovered that they sold it to NBC saying it was a strike-proof show, meaning there was a writer's strike in the offing at the time. So we had written the first 13 shows. All of those scripts had first drafts written. Then uh, on Halloween that year, the writer's strike happened, and no union writers could work on the show um, legally. And they said, well, you're a producer, you can stay on and oversee the writing. But they hired non-union writers from Canada, uh, um, who I did not think were particularly as well suited for it as the writers who had worked on Masters of Horror. And so they were doing all the rewriting. All, we were getting notes from the studio, notes from the network, notes from the advertisers. And I said, I'm, not, uh, I'm going out on the strike and I'm not coming back. It was like having my baby kidnapped and raped. And so they made some good ones. To this day, I've never seen all of the Fear Itself episodes. But that was intended to be season three of Masters of Horror. But when NBC bought it, they wanted a different title. So I came up with Fear Itself. And um, the rest, unfortunately, is history. <laughs> More, yeah. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you're going to touch upon it tomorrow, but who was uh, Stephen King like as a collaborator, or something hands-on? Stephen who? 
Well, we will talk about King extensively tomorrow, I'm sure. Steve McQueen. I've never worked with Steve McQueen. I can't answer that. So, no. um, Stephen King is the most generous. I said Spielberg was so generous. Creatively generous. Uh, King is the most wonderful guy in the world to work with. He's so supportive. I know, uh, and I've said this before, a lot of people think that because I've done so much work with him that I'm King's bitch. But um, he's never once told me how he thought I should cast something, how he thought I should uh, direct a scene or anything like that. He's always been there as a cheerleader. He, he'll voice his opinion on casting and things like that and be involved. And he's written the screenplays of some of the things we've done together. And I have never had anything but the greatest time in the world. And when he's on set, and I haven't had him on a set since The Shining, um, but He's like a kid with a giant set of trains. It's so much fun. He loves the process so much, and I would love nothing more than to do that again. Yeah. Are people ever scared of him on set? Well, the scariest thing that ever happened with him on set was when we were shooting The Stand, and we were in Las Vegas, and we were on, uh, uh, we were on Fremont Street, and it was, there were 600 extras. And I'd never made anything with 600 extras before. It happened to be the day King flew in on a private jet, landed, was driven to the set, he walked onto the set, and 600 extras overwhelmed him. And he said, I'm out of here, went back to the limo, went back to the private jet, and flew back home. So he wasn't scary, but, but yeah, he's six foot five, first of all. And um, an imposing figure, but he is so fun-loving. You know, he is not a dark guy at all. He's really somebody that you want to spend time with. He's funny and charming and just really enjoys the hell out of everything. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So there's more questions out there, guys? Here. Okay. Hey, I'm an independent filmmaker and screenwriter who's been inspired by your work for many years. So I think Thank you. My question is, uh, of all the movies you've done over the years, which one gives you the most fulfillment? Like writing, directing, producing, of all. Looking at it now, like which one uh, gives you the most fulfillment as an artist? That's a great question because each of those jobs is completely different from the others, and I never gave a shit about producing, except to protect myself, but then once I did Masters of Horror, suddenly I'm producing movies by all of these other guys and protecting them. So producing isn't something that I would choose to do, but I loved it because of Masters of Horror and now Nightmare Cinema, producing that in such a way that it's all creative. And I'm not a businessman, I don't wanna be. Um, but writing is very solitary. You're by yourself but you also have no one over your shoulder. You can make anything you want happen. You can create any character you want, give them whatever voice you want, any, any dialogue, any situation that you can imagine, you can do. But directing, when you're directing, that means it's getting made. 90% of what I've written has not been made, and I think most screenwriters would tell you that. But directing, once you're green lit and you're actually doing it, it's the opposite of the solitary job of writing because it's entirely social. And you have to have answers for 60 to 100 people every second of what's going on. And you have to live with what answers you give or direction you give to the various departments. So both of those, I love them equally in creative sense. But in a practical sense, I'm actually making the movie when I'm directing. So I, I think that would have to just edge out writing. But that's also why I write books, too. And I've just finished a new book uh, a couple weeks ago that, that uh, is just going out to publishers now and has just got our first really good reception today. So you may be seeing that sooner than later. How long is your process? Are you a long form writer as a screenwriter? I write very quickly. Yeah, I, I, I try to write 10 pages a day when I'm going, and I usually write mostly in the morning, so I want to have more than half of it done by lunch. So after lunch, I, I do an hour and I've done it. So, um, But, you know, I, I haven't been writing screenplays as much since I've been writing books, 
and because I get more work as a director than a writer these days, um, I've recently gotten into doing some episodic stuff, which I thought would be awful. But, you know, I did a couple episodes of Once Upon a Time, and a director for hire didn't have anything to do with the script or anything. One of the episodes is one of the most emotional scenes I've ever, the most emotional scene I've ever done in my life. Working with actors I didn't know, working from somebody else's script, I loved it. I've, I've only done maybe a half a dozen or so, but, you know, directing can be fantastic. Yeah. So there's a long answer to your question. Anything else? <laughs> Thanks. As, as fans, if we want to start a letter writing campaign, would you in charge the next critical project? Would you be the right to that? <laughs> there are so many fucking critics projects out there now. <laughs> and don't burden me with that. <laughs> No, I, I, I loved doing Critters. It was incredibly difficult to make. It was the coldest winter in 100 years in, in Southern California when we made it, I, including the day outside with the naked Critter uh, transformation. But um, she was a trooper. But uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know who was even in charge because they're two totally unrelated companies making the new binge and making the sci-fi movie. So I don't even know who does it anymore. New, new World, I mean New Line, was in charge of it originally, but I don't, I don't know what happened. New World, that's what brought back a memory. Like, yeah. New World Pictures <laughs> yeah, coming wait, back, wrong, wrong. hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Set that up. Yeah. Challenges in casting Randall Flagg. Challenges in casting Randall Flagg. You know, what happened was, the actor who we did end up with was good friends with Miguel Ferrer. And, and Jamie, who played Randall Flagg, was not a horror fan, didn't know that stuff, and didn't really want to play the devil. And <laughs> this will be uncensored Mick. Uh, Miguel said to him, are you kidding, man? I'd blow Mick to play Randall Flagg. <laughs> and he was fantastic, yeah. Yeah, I, and so, you know, this was, he had done, he played lawyers, he played cops, he'd done lots and lots of stuff, but, but it was the first time he'd done a genre film, and he nailed it. He was so good, and he, but he was great to work with, and really receptive to the ideas, and again, we had Stephen King on set for more than half of that shoot, as we did on The Shining. So, when you've got Stephen King there, it really helps excite everybody uh, about the whole process. And if I could actually riff on that, speaking of Miguel Ferrer, yeah. uh, he's always been such, you know, one of my favorite actors, just so great and everything. You know, what was, and you worked together multiple times, so obviously a good relationship there. What, um, what can you, you tell us? Do you know that he has a small, tiny part in The Shining? The voice. Yes, you yes, do know. Yes, I caught okay. that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's the voice on the on the CD CB yeah. uh, of of his father. Oh yeah, imagination. you recognize his voice anywhere. Yeah, it's such a great yeah, voice. Yeah, well, he had that really <laughs> low resonant. <laughs> um, Miguel was great. Uh, I, I couldn't believe when he passed away. Yeah, uh, you know, Awful. he was so young, and just an amazing actor. His father was an Academy Award winning actor. You know, really. Uh, remarkable guy and he was a drummer in a band that used know. to play around LA all the time and I'd go see the generators with a J. And, I did not uh, know either of those things. Yeah That's, wow. and, and he was fantastic. Wow. Yeah, and just a great guy and he always talked like James Elroy you know real bebop jazz kind of hey that cool daddy oh you know kind of stuff. And it, oh, he, he was wow. a wonderful guy. Wow very cool. Yeah. I'm very, very been cool very lucky with the people I work with and once you work with somebody great you want to do it more, you know. That's why Matt Frewer. I've worked with him like six times. I think. Oh yeah, we're definitely going to get into directing him and Christopher yeah. Lloyd tomorrow night for sure. Oh, Christopher Lloyd. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. there's uh, Henry Thomas. Uh, oh yeah. Melissa George, Annabeth Kish, <coughs> Molly Greenwald, Rob Lowe. What? Rob Lowe. And I had a great time working with Rob actually, and I'll, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Yeah, we're definitely yeah. going to talk about that tomorrow. But um, he's anybody? a huge Stephen King fan. Really? Yeah. Wow, I would not have known that. And he was playing someone who was deaf. He's deaf in one ear, and what he wanted to do was put a, a an ear wig that made noise in his other ear so he would be deaf. And I, it, it brings back the line from Sir Lawrence Olivier, what about acting, boy? <laughs> so, acting. 
Anyway, um, so any more? We, we had some more questions out there. I thought I saw someone on the sides. No? All right. Very cool. Well, I guess that uh, wraps it up for night one. You guys better be here tomorrow night. We have yeah. some serious stuff to talk about still. A lot. Thank you guys for coming out. I really appreciate it.